Mirchas Kayanim. We're all familiar with the mitzvah. We read it last week in the Torah. We say it every morning in our brachas. Dabe Hashem al Moshe. Hashem says, Mitzvah Dabe Alarim al Vanov to speak to the Kayanim. This is how you should bless the Jewish people. And we have the three psukim, the three blessings that the Kayanim should give the Jewish people. And the Soma Shmia Bene Yisrael Vani Avarechim. And I will place my name upon the Jewish people and I will bless them. And the Gemara says it means I'll bless the Jewish people. And it also means I will bless the Kayanim themselves who are delivering this bracha to the Jewish people. Says the Gemara in Sayyid Adaf Lamed Chesam Med Beis. Omer B'Shur Ben Levi, B'Shur Ben Levi says, Minayin Shah Kodesh Baruch Hu Misavu the Birch Haskainim. From where do we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu desires and yearns for the priestly blessing? Shanemar V'Samu Shmiya B'Nei Yisrael V'Yini Avarachim. We quote this Pasuk. V'Omer B'Shur Ben Levi, Adishin B'Shur Ben Levi says, Kol Koyin Shem Mevarich Eni Brukoyin who gives the bracha, Misbarich, <coughs> is also blessed, also receives the blessing. But a Kayan who does not give the blessing, does not receive a blessing. As Hashem said to Abraham Avino, I will bless those who bless you, and you deduce from that that those who don't bless you uh, will not be blessed. And the Bishur of Levi says, additionally, a third statement, Kol koyen she'ene oyla l'duchon, any koyen who does not go up on the platform, which means, once upon a time at least, and we, this is a separate discussion, but uh, there used to be the minhag, and it still is in some places, uh, the koyenim step up onto a platform or an erased uh, something, or a raised step to do the bracha, so that's how, even colloquially, we refer to it oftenly, often as duchening. What does duchening mean? So duchan is a platform. And duchening is when you make a noun into a verb, like, you know, vacuuming or Googling or Zoom, right? So duchening is the verb of going up onto the platform. Says the Gemara, Kol Koyen Sheinein Elul Duchan, any Koyen who does not go up on the Duchan, Oiver B'Shloi Sha'ase violates three positive mitzvahs. What are the three positive mitzvahs? First of all, it says, Koy Sevaruchu, so shall you bless. That's mitzvah number one. Amei Lahem, say to them, that's mitzvah number two. For Salma Shmi, they shall place my name on the Jewish people. That is mitzvah number three. <coughs> now, when do we duchen? We duchen during the repetition of the Amida, after the bracha of Moedim. After, in other words, just before the last bracha of the Amida, that's when we say the bracha of Birchas Kareinim. And by the way, the reason why um, the last bracha of the Amida focuses on Shalom, Sim Shalom, Toiba Bracha, Mavarech Hasam Yisrael, Ba Shalom, all about Shalom and peace, is because that bracha comes as a direct continuation from the end of Birchas Kareinim, which is the Yasem Lecha Shalom, who shall place you, give you peace. Therefore, Sim Shalim Teva Bracha. Why is that relevant? A few months ago I was looking up some things about that last bracha. I don't remember exactly what right now. And I came across this that, that, that the structure of the bracha is structured around being a continuation to Birchas Kayanim, and there were some ramifications from that. I don't remember exactly what off the top of my head. Um, there's an interesting minhag. Which I don't, I'm not aware of any place where this minhag is practiced today, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating minhag and, and it also is relevant to the research of this mitzvah, um, of this sugya. And that is like this the bracha of Ritzei, which is the bracha before Maidim, starts off like this Ritzei Hashem and the Kena Ba'amacha Yisrael with the Sidosim Shei. Hashem, we ask Hashem to turn to and to find pleasure, desire with the prayer of, of the Jewish people. Return the service to your holy sanctuary. You should accept the, 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 the fires of the Jewish people, the Karbanis. Now the halacha is that in order for the Kayan to Duchen, he has to already um, move his feet, that means start heading in the direction of where, the place where he's going to Duchen, when the when the chazan says the word Ritzei, mm-hmm. right? So, 
I think nowadays it's common that already early on in the repetition, um, after Kedusha, the Kainim will go out and wash their hands and come back and have their earlier, but that's the, the, the sort of the deadline. When the Chazan starts to say, that's the final chance for the Kainim to start get, getting moving. Ratzon. Now they used... Ratzon. Right. Now there used to be a minhag that you only say say when there's duchening. In a time when there's no duchening, we'll get to what those times are, but in an, a particular amida that you're not going to duchen, you don't say say at all. You start the bracha two lines later. Ishe Yisrael Sulasam Yavis Kam And so it was that that first line, this is brought in the Torah and in other places, that this first line of the, of, of the bracha of that Hashem should desire the service of the Kohenim was, of the Jewish people, was originally designed to be sort of connected to Birchas Kohenim. So it's an interesting tidbit in and of itself, but it also helps us because, for example, when we want to look back at the history of which places and which times <coughs> was the Duchening limited, like it is today, that we only Duchen on Yom Tif, which we could, that's really mainly what we're going to focus on today. So you have to look for clues, because if you're thinking of a time in a society where they Duchen every day, then you might not find that written anywhere explicitly because, um, because that was just taken for granted that you duchen every day. It wasn't considered something novel. But for example, you might, we find in some places where it says that by Shachris you start from Ritzei and on Mincha you start from Isha Yisrael. Why? So then you can un- deduce that this was a place that had this minhag and therefore by Shachris they duchen, so they start from Ritzei. And by Mincha we don't duchen. Now the truth is, that, so d- not duchening by Mincha is already, already explicit in the Gemara that you're not allowed to duchen by mincha because um, the kohen is not allowed, just like when a kohen does a service in the base of Mikdash, he's not allowed to be intoxicated. So he's also not allowed to be intoxicated by, by when, when, when he duchens. And uh, mincha is ready later on in the day. So, um, so, so, there's, um, so there's a concern that the kohen might already have had too much to drink. Um, and even if he hasn't had too much to drink, and um, we still don't do it, we just make a blanket rule, no duchening by mincha, with the exception of a fast day. Why can you use a fast day an exception? Because a fast day, uh, mincha, well, besides not going to drink, also the mincha used to be much more clear, and then a fast day, you'd have a mincha later in the day than you did in a regular day. So, Mela, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't confuse mincha of a fast day with a regular mincha, and therefore on a fast day, we do duchen by mincha, and there is remnants for that custom in our tradition. That in our siddur, whenever, when, in our siddur, whenever we, there's no duchening, even on Yom Tif, if there's no kayan, or during the year, any shachris, before, in the repetition of the Amida, the chazan says, Right? That we say, we sort of include this reference to Berchus Kainim and asking Hashem to give us the bracha that he told the Kainim to give us. So we only say that on a regular day, we only say that in Shachris, not at Mincha, because they never used to be duchening at Mincha. But on a fast day, we say it at Mincha. Right? Now, in the Gemara and in the Paschim, there's other discussions in those type of details. For example, Ne'ila, Shachris, oh, just, but just sorry, one more thing. Our minhag is that we duchen always by Musaf and Yom Tif, with the exception of Simchas Torah, we duchen by Shachris. Why do we duchen by Shachris or Simchas Torah? So at least one of the reasons is because the minhag is and was that after Shachris you make Kiddush. Once you make Kiddush, you can't duchen anymore because you might be intoxicated. So usually, eh, that's not the complete reason, there's other parts to it, but I'm just mentioning that. Um, now, in the Gemara, the discussion is, and in the yeah, which which tefillos do you do it in? Do you do it in Shachris? Do you do it in Musaf? Do you do it in Mincha? Do you do it in Neila? How many times, for example, do you do it in Yom Kippur? Do you do it four times? Do you do it three times? Four. Shachris, Musaf, Mincha, Neila. You can do it four times. Neila, no. Why? Never heard anyone. The Maisha, the, the, in practice, is different in Hagim. Chab- the, the common practice, and this is the Chabad practice, at least outside of Eretz Yisrael, the only Duchen once in Yom Kippur. But there are, in the Paschim, there are those who Duchen two times, three times, four times, there's different opinions. Anyway, but look, we could do a whole series and do the Sugya of Birchas Kainim over many months, but what we want to zoom in on today, and we'll see, 
I think it's possible that we'll do a follow-up next week. Maybe we'll do a two, possibly three. I don't think. I think we'll do maybe a two-part series on this. But what we really want to zoom in in, in zoom in on is the frequency of Birchus Koinim. For us, Ashkenazim, living and growing up in Chutz Laaretz, we associate Birchas Koinim with Yom Tif. It's part of the joy of Yom Tif. The Simcha of Yom Tif, you come, and there's a, a ceremony, and all the Levim go out, and here in Beis Menachem, we usually left without a minion while all the Levim, right? So, uh, there's also a whole discussion about what the basis for the Minhag, that the Levim wash the Kayin in his hand, and what to do if there's more Levi, too many Levim to Kayin ratio, how many Levim can participate, and there's all, every, every uh, element of it has a lot of discussion in this forum. Right, so we only do it on Yom Tif. Why are we, right? Just here, what about in Eretz Yisrael? Oh, in Eretz Yisrael. Now, before we get to Eretz Yisrael, by the way, yeah, even, Sfar- even outside Eretz Yisrael, um, Sfardim, Duchen, well, there's different, even among Sfardim, there's differences. Um, some Duchen of Shabbos, some Duchen of Here and locally, I'm not familiar, I don't know if anybody knows of hand what the Minak across the street over here is. If they have a Kohen. They do it every day over there? If they have a Kohen. Yeah. <laughs> certainly the one on Tui. Yeah. Certainly the, the, the Shul on, on Tui. Duchen every day if there's a Kohen. Um, that, that is definitely the Minak there. I believe there are other Sephardi communities outside of Eretz Yisrael who only Duchen on Shamas. I'm not sure exactly. Now, people say, it's famous, in Eretz Yisrael, everyone Duchens every day. Now, Hogufa, we have to understand... What, why should there be a difference? It doesn't, the mitzvah of Birchas Kainim is not a mitzvah that's more um, shaykh to Eretz Yisrael than it is to outside of Eretz Yisrael. So why should there be that difference of Minhag? Um, and also within Eretz Yisrael itself, there are some places, Chaifa, the Galil, where at least once upon a time it was clear that the Minhag in those places was to only Duchan on Shabbos. Over the years there has been some um, effort, at least on the part of some people, to change that, so what's the history of that? What's the basis for that? We're going to talk about all of that over the next. It, was there a unified minhag at the beginning, and then people started oh. battling the mitzvah? Or? So we, we got, we're going to see. But what we're going to start from is we're going to start from Chutz and so then uh, later, probably more next week, we'll get into some of the minhagim in Eretz um, Yisrael. The, 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 the north of Israel minhag blew up. In um, the late 70s, where there was a Rav Reb Sher Yoshev Kohen, who was at the time the chief rabbi of Haifa, who tried to change the minhag from duchening only on Shabbos to duchening every day. And he actually, there's a letter from the rabbi to him. He, dra- he wrote letters to many Gedoli Yisrael of the time. Um, and the rabbi is a very interestingly, very ambivalent letter to him. We, we'll, we'll see the rabbi's letter soon. Um, but many other good early Israel wrote letters, um, Rabbi Silber, and uh, uh, some supported him, some didn't support him. Um, and I think till today, it's probably difficult to say um, a unified minhag in the Galil in the north of Israel, because I think many places um, still maintain the minhag of only Duchening on Shabbos. In some places, they Rabbi um, Shai Yoshev Cohen's uh, campaign to institute it every day was successful. And so, you know, it, 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 it's hard to say a unified minhag. Of course, there's also what do Chabad do in the different places of Eretz Yisrael and all the controversies and politics behind that. Of course, nothing is free of controversy. Um, but let's go back to the basics. And again, we're going to start off from what's known as minhag Ashkenaz, the general Ashkenaz minhag. And when we say Ashkenaz, we don't just mean, you know, Germany the broader European Ashkenaz community, including, uh, you know, obviously Poland, Russia, etc., for many, many centuries has been to only Duchen on Yom Tov. But let's go back. Um, the Rambam writes in, the, in his introduction to Hilchus Tefillah, where he talks about Berch's Kohenim, that it's a mitzvah, I say, it's a positive commandment. How does he define the commandment? To bless the Jewish people each and every day. Right? So, that's the mitzvah. The mitzvah is to bless the Jewish people every day. A little bit more elaborate, I'll read to you from an English translation of the Sefer HaChinuch in Parshas Nosei Mitzvah Shina and Ches, Mitzvah 378. The commandment of the priest is blessing every day. And the priests were commanded that they should bless the Jewish the Israel every day. As it says, thus shall you bless the Jewish people, etc., etc., 
from the root mitzvah, principles of this mitzvah is that Hashem, in His great goodness to bless His people through the servants that are always encamped in the house of God, and all of their thoughts cling to His service, and their souls are connected to His fear the whole day, and in their merit the blessing rests upon the Jewish people, and all of their deeds are blessed, and the pleasantness of God will be upon them. And this commandment is practiced every day at all times by the priest, as this commandment to, uh, to bless Israel is upon them. Right? So, again, emphasizing that this is done every single day. And really, this is the, like I said, there's, there's so many details in Berchus Kedem to discuss, but I think the fundamental um, question that throws itself at our face is, there's a bit positive mitzvah in the Torah, three positive mitzvahs, that Hashem is misava, Hashem yearns for it, that the Kedem should bless the Jewish people every single day. And what, what's the deal with us having a minhag not to do so, and first of all, what's the basis and the validity of a minhag not to fulfill a biblical mitzvah, etc. Maybe now is a good time to mention something that all the Paschim who discuss this are going to say this. So we're going to come to it probably a number of different times, so I should put it up. A, a partial justification is as follows. When I say partial justification, what I mean is this doesn't answer the question. It doesn't explain how the Minhag developed to only Duchan and Yamtiv. And it also doesn't answer why would that be a good thing to do, but it does give a partial justification. And that is that even though the Kainim have a mitzvah, three mitzvahs even, to dukhan every day, but there's no transgression of the mitzvah unless they are explicitly invited to do so. In other words, the Kayin, before he does dukhaning, he, ha- he, he only, he only, he has a, he has to be summoned. The, the non kohen summons him to dukhan, and then after he's summoned to dukhan, that's when he has the obligation to do so. How do we fulfill the summoning when we do Duchen? Oh, Very good, right? Before Duchening, the Kayan calls out, But there's only one, isn't it? Okay, that's a side point. Um, in Eretz Yisrael, by the way, when it's done every day, so it doesn't have Duchening, doesn't have, they're not singing, and not, it doesn't have this whole pomp and ceremony. It's just very, you know, somebody, and it won't necessarily be the Chazan, it could be somebody else who will say, Kayanim! And then they'll start the bracha and go, Yivarechecha, Yivarechecha, Hashem, Hashem, yeah, yeah, you've, you've heard it, we heard it when you're married to Israel. I was going to I like to share, when I was in Israel a couple of years ago with Mendel, so one morning we'd have in Shachris in um, Zechra Moshe. It's what they call Shtiblach, what Americans sometimes call a minion factory, basically a time when you can go in a uh, shul where you could go in any time of the, uh, of, um, the morning and even not the morning <laughs> and find a minion shachas. <coughs> it's near my notes, you might be familiar. <coughs> <coughs> so, right next to us on the table, <coughs> the same table, was sitting a guy who was clearly very, very elderly and very physically limited. He was in a wheelchair. He was not able to put on his talus and fill it himself. He had an assistant who wheeled him to shul and helped him put on his talus and fill in. And he, you know, he was basically not just wheelchair bound, like could barely move bound. Anyway, as soon as Kedusha is over, I see his assistant turning his wheelchair around and taking him to the sink. And by the way, in Israel, where they do it every day, it's rare to see the Levim washing their hands. They usually just do it themselves. Um, and um, and he and he uh, and he's washing his hands. You know, he takes off the tefillin numb to his arm. He's washing his hands. I'm like, wow! Like he's gonna duchen like to duchen. You have to stand up and you have to raise your hands the whole time that you're saying your hands have to be lift, raised up. I was like, how's he gonna do this? So I sort of uh, kept my eyes on him. And indeed, he wheels him to the front of the shul and. He um, he positions like a tall stander for him to hold on to, mm-hmm. and he turns him around, puts the wheelchair behind him, and it comes the time for duchening, 
And this individual, you could see he's using every ounce of strength that he has to, to, to get himself up, his assistant's helping him up, and he's standing there. And at the moment that he has to start saying the bracha, he, he raises his hands, and it goes quick, you know, but you could see that he's like using every ounce of energy he can to remain standing and to remain with his hands up. And the moment he finishes the last word, Shalim, he literally collapsed down onto his wheelchair, which his assistant had kept in place. <laughs> And it was quite it was quite amazing to see, you know, the dedication that this person had to do in the mitzvah every day. You know, he could have very easily excused himself, and uh, it was it was uh, it was inspiring to see. Can I ask a question? Yeah. You said Mincha Ashkenazi is only on Yom Tov, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, Ashkenazi Minak is only right. to Zuchar on Yom Tov. What yeah. about the notion of you're supposed to bless your children every single day? Uh, no. So people could say the words Yiberachah and blessings to their children, to their friends. There's a common minhag, not the Chabad minhag, but there is a common minhag for people to bless their children with those words on Friday night, etc., etc. But that's not the mitzvah of Birchaz Kayin. The mitzvah of Birchaz Kayin is specifically for the Kayinim to do it in shul, in a certain standing up, during the repetition, with their hands raised, etc., etc. Now, <coughs> so scholars try to sort of trace exactly the origins of the minhag. <coughs> One important source. Make sure you say a bracha, Yasel. One important, important source is Mach Savitri. Mach Savitri is a sefer that we've discussed a number of times. We actually mentioned it a few weeks ago when we talked about Ak Thomas. Mach Savitri is mid- written by... It's a, it's a siddur that goes through the whole year with all the laws and customs, etc. And it's written by Rapsim Chavitri, who is a, um, a Talmud of Rashi. So very hardcore Ashkenaz going on in Mach Savitri. Now, the thing with Mach Zavitri is that it wasn't published. For the fir- we knew, always knew it existed, but it wasn't published until, um, I believe, the Tov Reish Nuns, which has got to be the 1890s. So, for many years, we knew of its existence, but we didn't actually have access to it. And then, you know, and fairly, fairly recently in the scheme of things, was the proper manuscript discovered and published. But in Mach Zavitri, um, is written, you know, as a Talmud of Rashi, so 12th century, basically. And over there, it's clear in Simon, in Simon Kuflamid, in chapter 130, um, that the, it says explicitly that the Koyanim noisim kapeim, they raise their hands, that's what we call duchering, of a mayadim, on Yom Tif, of a Chodosh al and on Chol HaMoyad, of a Rosh HaChadoshim, and on those days, b'shachris, over Musaf, and shachris, and Musaf, of a Chayil, b'shachris, and during the weekday, it's done only during shachris. So it's clear that at least in the time and space of Rashi, a Mach Savitri, Duchening was still practiced every single day. So somehow, post-Rashi, Minhag Ashkenaz develops to limit Birchaz Um So, one of the earliest sources for this is Sefer Chassidim. Now, Sefer Chassidim, written by Rebuda Achasid, you're talking about the early Hasidic movement of Ashkenaz, not what we call today the Hasidic movement founded by the Baal Shem Tev, but the Hasidic Ashkenaz. And the Hasidic Ashkenaz, as Hasidim today, are, this, are, 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 are um, the, the unique, the, the sort of, the, the, the underlying uh, feature is to, do, to, to be extra pious and extra pure, extra religious, and to go above and beyond in that regard. So in Sefer Chassidim, now within Sefer Chassidim, there are different, um, there's different editions of it, with different, some things are found in one edition and not in the other, and even in editions where you've both had the same things, the, the numbering system is different. So in the Sefer Chassidim that I've taken this from, it's known as Sefer Chassidim Ksav Yad Farmer, from the Farmer Manuscript, and in that particular edition, it's in Simon Tov, 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 Yud Gimel. Anybody do the math? Tov, 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 yud gimel? It's 1613. Right? Tov, tov, tov is 400, so tov, 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 tov is. 1200. 12, no, 1600. 1600. Right? It says like this In Higo, a koinim, a yom tevim, the koinim have instituted to go up to the duchon on yom tev. The fish a chayv adam natahir beregel because. A person is obligated to purify himself on the holiday. Because the Kayanim would um, purify themselves and bless during when they are in a pure state. In the days of the early stages, 
they would do the blessing every day. Now that we're not so careful, we'll see what that means soon. It used to be that they were more careful and they would bless every day. But now we're less careful. And so, but on Yom Tif, when we say we ask Hashem for the blessing of the Yom Tif, so then we do the Now, so the Sefer Chassidim is introducing here the concept of Chayv Adam Taratz Ben Beregel. He's introducing here the concept of purity. Oh, so this fits very well with Sefer Chassidim, with the Chassid Ashkenaz movement. They're very, they're very concerned with maintaining purity. Now, the halacha is Chayv Adam Taratz Ben Beregel that a person has to make himself pure on the, the, the three pilgrimage festivals. Why does a person have to make himself pure in those days? Because the mitzvah was to go to the Beis HaMikdash. Before you go to the Beis HaMikdash, you have to make yourself pure. Now, there's some discussion of whether or not that halacha, strictly speaking, applies nowadays. But certainly in practice, I think, till today, um, there are many people who do not go to mikvah year-round, but who do go to mikvah every Arab Yom Tif. And the way I know this, amongst oh. others, is because the mikvah ra- jacks up the prices <laughs> on Arab Yom Tif even more than they do on Arab Shabbos. Oh. Right? If you go to Tui Mikvah on a Friday, I think it's $7, and on Arab Yom Tif, I think it's $10. Highway robbery. Okay, so the so 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 oh, so you see from the Sefer Chassidim, in the olden days they were more careful. In other words, he's saying the olden days they maintained a higher level of purity. Nowadays, where people are, the kainim are not pure, so that that's why they're avoiding duchening because they're not pure. Interesting, and then they're not guaranteed to be. Uh, oh, one second. Fine. One second. I'm sorry, they're not. Is that what you mean by not pure? They're not guaranteed absolutely to be a Kohen. Oh, you're jumping way ahead. Very good, but you got to hold your horses. <laughs> um, uh, so. No, he's saying they're not pure. So on a regular day, the Kohen is not pure. He could be Tommy. Um, but before Yom Tif, everybody goes to to the mikvah. So in Hegel, HaKohen, now, by the way. It, the, if you're precise in the wording of the Sefer I don't want to get too sidetracked, but too, too focused on this, but I just want to point out, there's even a little bit of a reference that maybe there used to be a custom not to duchen at all, ever. And the Kohenim inst- instituted that we can do it on Yom Tif because on Yom Tif everybody's pure and it's a time of blessing. So I'm saying there may be an indication that the Sefer Chassidim is saying that there used to be a minag not to duchen at all and there was the novelty to do it on Yom Tif. Why am I saying that? We'll see soon that there is actually record of almost such a minah. But what we do see clearly from the Sefer Chassidim, which seems to be the earliest origins um, that we can find of this minag, is that the hesitance to duchen regularly was because they wanted a duchen in a um, in a state of purity. Now, in general about state of purity for davening and for things like that, duchening is, you know, it's come to be a part of davening. So there is the concept of Tfilas Ezra. Tfilas Ezra is, the Gemara says, uh, well, Tfilas Ezra originally was Ezra HaKoy and Ezra HaSoifer. He made a Takana. He instituted that a Balkari, somebody who's experienced a seminal emission, has to go to Mikvah before doing any Torah and before doing any tefillah. Our little kindlach over here who have learned Mesech des Brachas in Cheder can tell you that there's a balkari, there's a, but the Mishnah says, there's a balkari allowed to say Krishma. He has to go down into the water if he can finish doing it before Zman Krishma. You remember this, uh, uh, Izzy Yitzchak? Vaguely. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? A little bit. You're in the Miskasa. Yeah, Imam. Yeah, you remember this? The okay. Is, no. What? No, they don't remember. Ah. But they'll tell you they remember. Okay. We'll give them a for her afterwards. Right? Now. Then comes along Rabbi Huda ben Bas. Oh, nah, I'm going to go scooter home. Then Rabbi <laughs> Huda, uh, <coughs> Rabbi Huda ben Basayra says, Rabbi Huda ben Basayra says, Divrei Torah are not makabel In other words, the original takana was. I'm sorry. Let's let's back up. The original takana was <coughs> that if your person is a balkari, then he may not daven and he may not study Torah. This takana did not take take a stronghold. In other words, it didn't last. 
And the Rambam describes exactly why didn't, you know, it, people didn't keep it, it was too much, and the sages themselves realized that this wasn't uh, something that can be maintained. And so, strictly speaking, halachically, nowadays there is no obligation for Balkari to go to mikvah, and he may study Torah, and he may daven and do any mitzvah, even in the state of um, uh, of, 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 of Balkari. In other words, he's had a seminal mission. So again, a seminal mission can be um, can be even if it's from the mitzvah of being intimate with his wife, or it could be in another circumstance, it doesn't matter, he's a Balkari. And the original Takana was um, that such a person must go to mikvah before studying Torah or learning or learning. Now, strictly speaking, like I said, this Takana no longer applies. However, there is some discussion um, he says so he's already early on he says that the Torah is like fire and fire is not susceptible to impurity and therefore he says you a Valkyrie is allowed to study Torah so there is this middle ground where you say a Valkyrie is allowed to study Torah but he's not allowed to daven now um, nowadays I would say that I think it's most common by Hasidim to be careful about Tefillah Sezra and there are many, most fa- one of the most famous sources for this is in the Sefer Mori Vashamesh, in the beginning of Parshas Achim uh, Kudeshim Emery, somewhere over there, where he talks about the importance of making sure that to go to mikvah before you daven, if you're a Balkari, and certainly if you're the Shliach Tzibur, if you're, the, if you're having an Aliyah, if you're being the Chazan, etc., that you should go. In fact, in, 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 in some shul, by the way, in some shuls, they have... Uh, the takhanas, what, what do you, if you want to dive in for the Ahmed in this shul, this is what you have to do. So you have to wear a hat, you have to wear a jacket, you have to wear a gartel. In some, ta- in some, some shuls, one of the list of takhanas is, if you want to be the chazan, you have to have gone to mikvah that day. Now, that's not to say that the Hasidic minig of going to mikvah regularly is only for Tefillah Ezra. The Hasidic minig to go to mikvah regularly includes also in absence of Tefillah Sezer, just a minute to go every day for extra purity. We're not getting too much into the details of that right now. But coming back here, the 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 minak that the Sefer Chassidim is really telling us here is that the Kainim didn't duchen because not every some of them may have been Balkari, and so um, you're not going to start differentiating. If you are, you're not. That's it. No duchening. But on Yom Tif, where everybody goes to Mikvah before Yom Tif, so they're going to um, be tired, so therefore we do it on Yom Tif. Similarly, that, sorry? When you say Hasidim, because you draw the, you drew the distinction. Uh, well, well, I think there's two... There's two and from the Baal Shem Tov. Well, the, the Hasidic movement that we're familiar with today is the movement established by the Baal Shem Tov, okay, and right. that's, again, what we usually call today the Hasidic movement. There's a much earlier movement called the movement of Hasidic Ashkenaz, which is in Germany in the 12th, 13th century, okay. which is obviously nothing to do with the, the, with the Hasidic day. movement today. Okay. I mean, there, there, there may be similarities, but it's two completely diff- different movements. But the one Hasidic... Ashkenaz doesn't exist today. No, the Hasidic that. Ashkenaz movement is not a movement that is current. It's a, okay. yeah. Okay. Now, <coughs> ahead of, uh, I think you had a fairly short lifespan. Anyway. Um, <coughs> similarly, we find in the Shuvas sh- of the Maharam in Rutenberg, so here we have a very prominent Ashkenazi Pesach, the teacher of the Rosh, one of the very important uh, founders of, 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 of Halacha, according to the Ashkenaz, Ashkenazi Mesera, he writes over there, Al Koyen Shanusia is kapav concerning a Koyen who's looking, Shatamat Sukhlet Tvila, you require him to have Tvila, Aflu Fimai Denoi Gama Hakanech Tlosasabi, even according to the current custom that we don't require a Balkari to go to Mikvah in order to daven or study Torah. Minikoshu, but your requirement that a Koyen should go to Mikvah before Dukhaning is an appropriate Minak. The Aflu Tvila Kosh. There are some Goinim who said that it's even necessary for davening. A Kolshkin says Kapayim, so certainly it should be necessary for Duchening. I believe, says the Maram Rutenberg, that all the Kainim do this, right? So the Maram Rutenberg is saying that his, his, his experience that all of the Kainim in his vicinity were careful only to Duchen. I don't know if they were only Duchening on Yom Tov, or I don't know exactly where the Minag was up to in his time and place. But what he is testifying to is the fact that the Kainim were careful to only duchen um, if they had fulfilled Tfilah Sezer. They had gone to Mikvah after a seminal mission. 
However, he says, if a kohen is sick, so then instead of it's too hard for him to go to mikvah, then as long as he has tisha kabin, he pours nine kav of water over himself, which, let's just say in contemporary language, that means he has a shower, mm-hmm. that's also uh, better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, that seems to be the earliest um, reason for this, and it's sort of connected to the pietistic um, minhagim of Ashkenaz. Moving on, you have in the Sefer Arches Chaim, not Arches Chaim of the Rosh, this is a different Arches Chaim, the Arches Chaim of the Kolboi, where he says <coughs> that nowadays the Minach is only Sudduchan on Shabbos and Yom Tif, so this is some sort of middle way Minach where they're Sudduchaning not on the weekday, but yes on Shabbos and Yom Tif. The Afshakinimnu Mimti Tari Chatzibur says perhaps the reason is Tari Chatzibur, that uh, it's, it's a burden on the congregation, you know, during the week people are rushing to work. You know, how long does Duchening take? An extra few minutes? Okay, but you know, people's time is precious. It could be that during the week it was not convenient for people and so it sort of faded out. But on Shabbos and Yom Tov, where people have more time, nobody's rushing anywhere. So the custom, so, so, so then we did still um, keep to the Duchening every day. Of course, it could be the Kahana, but are busy. <laughs> oh, very good. Um, yeah. Or the Maybe I'll share a story at this juncture then. Mm. So, in Kfar Chabad, in Kfar Chabad, the Minhag is the Duchen on Shabbos. Um, now, like I alluded to before, the Chabad custom in Eretz Yisrael, in every different location, is um, full of controversy, and you always have people. Ah, no, what's the what's the the gist of it again? Here I have here. Uh, whole, whole, you know, whatever this is, 100 pages or so, uh, 50 pages, it's a good contrast. Somebody, one, one of the polemics from one of, a Chabad Israeli rabbi, Rabbi Tuvi Bloy, in his book, Al Minhagim Mumukari Sehem, where he's very pro the Duchening every day in Eretz Yisrael, and he's um, attempting to demonstrate that um, those who are against Duchening every day in the Chabad community in Eretz Yisrael are misrepresenting what the Rebbe said and what the Rebbe meant. Anyway, it's lots of fun, you can read it, whatever. <laughs> But what's at play over here? At play is, on the one hand, the, why should Chabad be different? You know, in Israel, the minhag is to look at every day. So you look every day. On the other hand, there is the, 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 this agenda, which I think is more strong in Chabad than it is in other places. Of, we like to do things the way it was done by the Rebbe in Lubavitch, in the, you know, at home. So there is those two agendas at play. Now, there is a story with Reb Shnei Adarav. Reb Shnei Adarav was Reb Shnei Zalman Gorelik, who was a tremendous chassid and Talmud Chacham, and he was the Rav of Kfar Chabad from its founding in 1949 until he passed away in somewhere in the mid-60s, I forget exactly. There are numerous editions and versions of this story, and obviously those who are pro the Duchening every day are going to say one version of the story, and those who say, you know, and here he brings all the different versions of the story. I'm going to share the version of the story that I heard from Rabbi Katz. Rabbi Katz, or Yankel Katz, is the father of... Uh, you know him. Uh, we have here, and in, in locally we have Chabad of Buffalo Grove is Rabbi Shmulek Katz. His father was Rabbi Yankel Katz. Rabbi Yankel Katz lived in Eretz Yisrael in Bnei Brak, and he was Rosh Hashiv in Kfar Chabad. And he was a tremendous chassid and Talmud Chacham, and I had the schus of getting to know him somewhat and having some schmoozing with him. So one time I had a whole schmooze with him about Berkus Kainim, and this is the way he told me the story, that um, there was a kohen in the, uh, you know, initially when Kfar Chabad was founded, it was very small, it was just a few families, a small community, um, people working very hard. And there was a, a Koyen, a single Koyen family by the name of Rivkin. Now the Rivkins were farmers and they would work on tractors um, with big money boots. And the halacha is that the Koyen has to remove his shoes before he duchens. Um, by the way, I just was reading yesterday, on Friday, um, the... Sorry. Takonis published in 1847 by Chief Rabbi Adler of the British Empire Commonwealth. Um, so Steve, you're listening. This is about you. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so, um, part of the, so it's basically the constitution for all Orthodox schools in England. And um, over there it says it talks about maintaining decorum and, and respect, etc. And one of its things is uh, so, so th- th- they had the, you know the kind to go up with their socks. That wasn't very you know. So the, the shul had to provide. Um, a certain type of slippers, which he called, there's a word for it, li- lifts. I forgot. I forgot right now what, what it was called. A certain type of slippers that they would provide for the kohenim, um, which again I've, n- I've never seen anybody, and I'm not even sure aware of the, exactly the halachas 
of which type of slipper would be permissible for a Kayan to wear during Duchening. But either way, that was an interesting anecdote. Anyway, back to Kfar Chabad. So says Rabbi Katz, the Minag was, this is Rabbi Rivkin, he was a farmer, and he would come every shachr, a day to Shachris, and he was rushing out to work, and he had these big muddy boots on with his tractors, and to take them off to Duchen was a whole up, would have been a whole operation, and so he didn't Duchen. Mm-hmm. On Shabbos, he Duchened. Mm-hmm. Now, in 1961, I believe it, it was, Rabbi Reb Shteh, the Rav, the Rav Kachavad, came for Tishrei, I believe, to the Rebbe, and at that point he discussed a number of different things with the Rebbe, including what should he do about the minhag, uh, the practice of only duchening on Shabbos, should he allow it to continue, should he institute daily duchening, and Rabbi, the, and the Rebbe told him, the Rabbi asked him, are there other places in Eretz Yisrael where they only duchen on Shabbos? And he said, yes, in the Gala, like I mentioned earlier, in Haifa, etc., in the north, they only duchen on Shabbos. So the Rebbe said that if that's the case, leave it as it is, that they only duchen on Shabbos, and that's why till today, the Menach in Kfar Chabad is that they only duchen on Shabbos, and on Shabbos they duchen twice, by Shachris and by Musaf. Um, now, then the Rebbe added that we just read yesterday in the parasha, I mentioned this for those who were here yesterday, of Yom Simchas, and then in Devi rejoicing, in Shabbos, this refers to Shabbos, and Duchen is connected to rejoicing, so there's an association with Shabbos. What's the connection between Duchen and rejoicing? We're going to get to that. Now, we have one more early source to read from this, and that is from the Shuvas of the Maharil, where he writes like this. So, you, the Maharil, again, is one of the very prominent um, sources and authorities when it comes to Minag Ashkenaz, and he's already 14th century, and he writes like this, um, The Mari Mulin, the leader of the generation, has already been asked, Say why the kainim not duchening every day, which is a positive mitzvah. True, but the answer is how do you know since kapayim b'chol yom? So here he packs in a whole bunch of different reasons. Shamati mi pi meiri chach meiri chami kana rabba dohu mishum dunagi kainim litpel. I heard the reason that it's because the minhag was to go to the mikvah. Kedi isa ba'gab yesh ma. Um, and there are times when it's difficult for them to, to go to mikvah, or that it's embarrassing for them to go to mikvah. There are times where a person may have had an accidental seminal mission. And there are people who are, um, you know, being intimate with their wives constantly, so it would mean they would have to go to mikvah every day. And if they would, if only some, if only those kainim who didn't go to mikvah, who, who, yeah, if only they were not duchen, so then they would be embarrassed. <laughs> so, you know, that's why. So that's kind of referencing the first reason we said. Then he continues. Right? That was the second reason which we quoted earlier from the Chaim. That is because of Bittl Malacha. So just like um, so for example even on Shabbos he says where strictly speaking it's permissible to make more than seven aliyahs he's saying we don't do so um, because uh, we don't want to keep people in shul longer than necessary. So that's why we don't do We don't want to keep people in shul longer than necessary. And maybe it even has bittel Torah and Torah Chetzimah. Okay, so that's the second reason that even though it's just a small bittel Kotlon, even it's just a small interference, it's not so long, still could be the reason it has to do with that. Um, ba-bam. The a third reason, because there are goyim in shul. What's the problem with goyim in shul? Because um, I guess the point is that the mitzvah is to bless the Jewish people, and if there's going to be a goy there, so maybe in Europe there was some more practice for non-Jewish tourists to come and see the shul, so there might be concern of giving a bracha to the goy. Okay, so maybe there's goyim, which, by the way, is also uh, I saw in, in one of the one of the important articles on this topic where he really goes through all the sources is an article by the, uh, an individual of the name of Yitzchak Zimmer, or known as Eric Zimmer. It's published in his book Elam Kimin Hadi Noyeg, and earlier uh, it was already published in the journal Sinai in um, Gilyoin um, 100 Gilyoin Kuf. Um, so one of the th- questions he asks is. 
well, and he finds, you know, he, he's, he's like an academic, he's finding sources for everything that, that uh, on the contrary, that it would have been more common for there to be non-Jewish visitors in the shul on Yom Tif than it would have been during the weekday. But either way, that's what the Maharil says. But all of this assumes it's like this, the, the mitzvah, the form it is da, in Duchening is like mid, Rabbanan, right? Oh, so what, essentially what we're saying is, he says this, the Maharil says this, I mentioned this earlier, that the mitzvah is to Duchen every day. But you're only violating the mitzvah if you were summoned to Duchen. If you weren't summoned to Duchen, you're not violating the mitzvah, you're just not fulfilling the mitzvah, right? It's like if you don't wear tzitzis, you're not violating the mitzvah. If you wear four-cornered garments without tzitzis, you're violating the mitzvah. If you don't wear four-cornered garments, you're just not fulfilling the mitzvah. Uh. So the kind of are not fulfilling the mitzvah. Why? Well, because they, we, 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 they didn't go to mikveh, because it takes too long, because there's goyim around. We have all these other, so, uh, the, the, these reasons. Now, Does that mean I'm like, Shabbos, I should step outside? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you'll be taught. No, just kidding. <laughs> you're good. You, you, you're good. Um, so, The Ramah, chief Pesach of Ashkenaz, yeah, he writes, and it's more elaborate in his commentary on the Torah and the Archim Moshe, and um, basically he says like this, I say, what time is it? Wow, it's so late. <coughs> he says, I say like this, I knew I say, that the reason that they thought to be the the non-important reason, that is actually the main reason why we only do Chanan Yom Tev. It has to do with bitul malacha, with the, the people not being able to go to work. But he doesn't present it, so the Ramah doesn't mention anything about the, the Goyim, he doesn't mention anything about the Mikvah, he only mentions about the issue of going to work, but he gives a twist to it. He says, it's not because, you know, people are going to get to work two days later, two minutes later. He says, the problem is, because people are stressed out about their work, so they're not in a state of simcha. And if you're not in a state of simcha, it's not a good time to, to, to give a bracha. He doesn't mention this, but another svarim I saw mentioned that you find, what does Yitzchak say before he wants to give a bracha to his children, to Esau and then to Yaakov? He would go make me food so that I could be in a, in a, in a good place to give you a bracha. So and even on Shabbos when people don't go to work, but people are still, you know, in that mode of con- being concerned about the parnasas, so we don't do a, 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 a bracha, but on Yom Tev, when it's day of rejoicing, so that's why we do on Yom Tev. Yeah? Why do we do it? Okay, let, let's read. There's more details. Why Yom Tov, Why? Why only on? Uh, why only by Musaf on Yom Tov? So let me read to you how this is presented by the Alter Rebbe in Chapter Kuf Chaf Ches, 128. And I'm going to read to you in the interest of saving some time. I'm going to interest. I'm going to read this to you straight out of the English translation of the Alter Rebbe in Simon Kuf Kofches, chapter Sif Nun Zayin, number 57. The custom in all these lands is that the priestly blessing is conferred only on a Yom Tif, because then people are in a joyful and festive mood, and only one who is glad of heart shall bless. On other days, by contrast, even on Shabbos, the Kainim are preoccupied with their livelihood and the loss of working hours, and they are not in a happy state of mind. Indeed, even on Yom Tif, the priestly blessing is conferred only in the Musaf service. Why? When directly afterwards we will leave the shul and partake of the Yom Tif meal and rejoice in the celebration of the festival. So you know why you do in the Musaf? Because you're about to have your cheesecake, that's why. Okay? Even though Yom Kippur, okay, then the Alter Rebbe goes into Yom Kippur, but again, in the interest of time, we're going to skip the discussion of Yom Kippur. Now, there was a minhag. Oh, look at this. What about when Yom Tov falls on Shabbos? So there it was a minhag. This is another part of the controversy. There was a minhag in some places that when Yom Tov falls on Shabbos, you don't dochen. Now, who could think why? There might be a minhag not to dochen. Based on everything we've discussed, <laughs> too much kedusha. Why might we not dochen on Yom Tov that falls on Shabbos? Because it's Shabbos of If the whole minhag is to go to dochen in a state of purity, and you've gone to mikvah on erev Yom Tov, but Friday night is a time when uh, I know Friday night is a special mitzvah for a husband and wife to be together. So even if you went to mikvah yesterday, um, by now you're not t- you're a balkari again. So um, that is a minhag which. 
uh, many Paskim fought tooth and nail. Until today, there are some shuls who don't duchen. I know growing up in England, certainly there were some shuls who did not duchen when Yom Tefal and Shabbos. And it's always a major thing. Do you change the minhag? Do you not change the minhag? But let's read how the Alter Rebbe says it. Um, when either Yom Tefal or Yom Kippur falls on Shabbos, um, <laughs> Additional holiness of Shabbos is not appropriate reason to suspend Birchus Kainim. There are other places in which it is customary not to do Birchus Kainim when Yom falls on Shabbos, and the rationale is that some Kainim customarily immerse in the mikveh for Birchus Kainim, and therefore they don't engage in relation and marital relations on a regular Yom Tif that's not on Shabbos. Hence, when Yom Tif falls on Shabbos, they do not wish to suspend their conjugal duties, which is to do it on Shabbos. Um, and they also do not wish to immerse again in the morning for the reasons explained in uh, section 326 that going to mikvah on Shabbos is a problem. And therefore, and of course, now, of course, this reason wouldn't apply when Yom Kippur falls on Shabbos because it's forbidden to be intimate on, on Yom Kippur. But anyway, in fact, however, um, if a night of Yom Tif falls during the week, it is the night of a woman's immersion. The couple should be intimate and the husband should immerse on Yom Tif. Anyway, then the al finishes like this. All the above reasons are given merely to justify the above-described custom of refraining from conferring Berchus Kainim, though these reasons are not sufficient weight to override a positive scriptural commandment. People who follow this custom have not transgressed any mitzvah as long as no announcement of Kainim is made. Nevertheless, encouragement is due. Listen to this. Nevertheless. So in other words, what the al is summarizing is, look, we have all these reasons. They're not really enough to justify it, but that's what we got. That's the custom, whatever it is. Yashir koicham. He translates that as encouragement is due. Yeah, may the strength be, guys, may the strength, strength, be, strength be on those in Israel and in the surrounding lands who duchen every day as the sages ordained and they fulfill three positive mitzvahs. Okay? So... There you have it. That's the way the Alter Rebbe says in the Shulchan Aruch. Now, um, the Ramah, of course, says that uh, you don't have to for the reasons that he's expressed, but the Israeli Ashkenazim still do it anyway. Yeah. They so, him, so, so, so what? What? what as I'm seeing how the time is going, what we're going to have to do is we're not going to talk about Eretz Yisrael at all today. That will be next week. How the Minhag and Eretz Yisrael developed in the different places. In Yerushalayim, in the Golod, the Ashkenazim, the Sfadim, the Chassidim, the Misnagdim, and there's a lot of interesting history there. Um, but I want to finish off with a few other points. Firstly, over the generations, there were. I didn't even get to the to, to the Shazuchos Menashemayim. Shalos Hatshuvas Ben Hashemayim is another important Ashkenazi source where I'm just going to mention very briefly that you see over here what I alluded to before from the Sefer Chesinim that there were places where the Kohenim didn't duchen at all um, or maybe only duchened once a year. And um, you also see the source here about going to Mikvah. And he asks, uh, and over there he writes about the importance of going to Mikvah before davening in general and, and before duchening, but also that you should not limit duchening to only once a year it should be more common than that. Okay, that's about as much time as we have for that. Well, that's in two different places in Shalos HaTshuvah's Min Um Now, over the generations, there were a number of, there's a number of different sto- stories of G'dayla Yisrael who wanted to try and change the Min HaGenashkenaz, and for the remaining few minutes, this is what we're going to address. So firstly, there is the stories, traditions of both uh, the Vilna Goyen, and his student, Reb Chaim that they both wanted to start Birchus Kainim, reinstitute Birchus Kainim every day, and um, things happened in a way that made them reconsider. So the story goes with the Vilodoyen, that on the day that he decided that tomorrow he would be uh, initiate Birchus Kainim in his shul again, um, that day he was arrested on false charges, so he saw that as a sign that he shouldn't be doing it. Okay. I believe the story of Reb Chaim Velozhen is about something that he was going to reinstitute Bechus Kainim, and then that day there was a fire and the whole town burned down, or the, the shul burned down, or something like that, which unfortunately these big fires, once upon a time in, in small towns that were all built of wood houses, was not um, uncommon. Another, um, in the Aruch HaShulchan, the Aruch HaShulchan, is um, oh very good Epstein 
a very prominent Pesach. On the one hand, he's not Hasidish at all. On the other hand, he is Russian, so there's a lot of parallel with Chabad and Aruch Hashulchan, but that's not the Geta now. But in his summary of this discussion, he goes through much of what we've already said, and listen to this. Certainly there is no good reason for our minag. To annul the positive mitzvah of the entire year. They have already written that this is a bad minag. What can we do? It is as if there is a heavenly voice that has ordained to not allow us to the rest of the year. Mukublani and I have received Shashne Gudoyli Adoy, the two um Gudoyli Adoy, great leaders of the generation, Budoy Shalfenu in previous generation, um Kalachabim Kaimi, each in his own place, Ratzal Hanim Nasis Kapaim wanted to institute Birchas Kainim, Ukshek Bilo Yemang Mukbalaze, and when they designated the specific day on which they would start doing it, this Balbal in the 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 some it became confused with Allahem and they were not successful in doing this. For Amr and they said Shayroyim that they seek him in Hashemaim Nigzur Kane that from heaven it has been decreed not to do so. Umitzadin, okay, he goes on. So I believe the two people he's talking about are most likely the Vilna and Abchaim Velozhna, and uh, obviously the Aruch Shulchan is kind of from the same school as them, so I imagine that's who he's talking about. Um, another, let's try and stick to just another two important sources. In the 16th century and 17th century, there was a major calamity that befell the Jewish people and that is the rise of the false messiah Shabtai Tzvi um, one uh, Shabtai Tzvi is a huge topic, we're not going into it, if anybody's interested um, uh, in learning more about it, one of the good resources is this Farm Chatter podcast who had like I think a 10 part series on Shabtai Tzvi so you can go and learn all about it now as you can imagine is befitting messianic fervor. One of the things of Shabbat Tzvi was reinstituting d- duchening every day, every Shabbos, whatever it is. So, one of the times when this question comes up is in the year Tov Chav Zayin. Tov Chav Zayin has to be 1667, I think. In Tov Chav Zayin, that is the year that Shabbat Tzvi converted to Islam. Now, what happens with chapter? What happens to all his followers? So there was divide, but some of his followers continued believing in him and following him even even after his uh, co- conversion. But many of his followers realized, okay, that is where the buck stops, and um, they realized that he had been uh, that you know that been led astray and that he was um, a sham all along. Mm. So chapter two had a strong Why influence. Would We're not going. We're not going into Shabbat Tzvi right now. One of the one of the communities where he had a strong impact was in Amsterdam, in the Spanish or Spanish Spanish Portuguese the Sephardi community that's called the Spanish Portuguese community in Amsterdam, and they had developed the minhag. Okay, they had developed the minhag based on Shabbat Tzvi that they were duchening every Shabbos, and now when they realized that you know that oh whoops. So the question is, well, you know, all the other things that we started doing because we were listening to him, of course, we're going to stop doing. But this, we started doing every Shabbos, well, I said, that's a mitzvah. Should we keep it up or not? Um, and one of the people, so, so, so one of the big, um, one of the people who for years already has been fighting against Shabbat Tzvi is an individual by the name of Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas. And they turned to Rabbi Yaakov to support us to ask him, like, what do we do now? Do we continue to or not? And uh, we're not going to get into all the details of the tshuva of Rabbi Yaakov to support us, but he basically would tell them, no, you should stop to because you only did it because of him, so you have to stop. And then if you want to reinstitute it on new grounds, perhaps there's room for that. Anyway, so that became another time when this question of Bichas Kainim regularly became a big topic was in the wake of Shabtai Tzvi's um, you know, influence. Now, and here we're going to get to the final discussion for today. Final discussion for today goes as follows. There was a very prominent Rav 
it wasn't actually a rav, a very prominent poison to Hamid Chochem by the name of Rabbi Ephraim Zalman Margolius. Rabbi Ephraim Zalman Margolius lived in Brody, which was in Broad, Brody, which was. So Rabbi Ephraim Zalman <coughs> Margolius, he was a very important, yeah, he wasn't a rav, but he was also wealthy, so he was able to afford to publish all of his, his foreign. But he was a very, very prominent figure, and uh, thank you. And he, um, there's a truva of his in. Um, in, in his Sefer, Shalas Shuvah, Space Ephraim, a very lengthy Shuvah about Duchening every day. And the way it's, the, the way it's published in, the, in, in his Sefer is kind of very, you know, oh, you ask about Bukhus Kenem every day, what's the reason for it, should we change it, and here's what I have to say. Now, there is a Sefer called Shnois Doiver Doir, which is basically an individual who lives in Cleveland, his name is Rabbi Ruvain Dove Dessler. And he is a, a, collects, a collector of old manuscripts and stuff, and he very kindly publishes everything that he, um, that he buys. So he bought the manuscript of this Shuva, and he published it in his book, Shnei Stavadur, Volume 4. And over there you get to see the full context of the Shuva, including those parts of the Shuva that were originally edited out of, his, uh, of the Sefer and, and not, uh, not published. And the original context is, and again, we don't have time, we've already gone over time, so we're going to have to keep this very brief. But basically, there was an individual by the name of Reb Shmuel Osterer, if I'm pronouncing that right, correctly. And he was a great uh, chassid, and again, uh, not a chassid, uh, what we call today a chassid, but he was a great pietist and, 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 and mystic. And, and he, he used to, he was very into sits at all sorts of very mystical and, 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 and those type of customs that he would have. And he instituted Duchening every day in his shul. And this tshuva from Rabbi Ephraim Zama Margolius is written to him. And in the manuscript you get to see all the, you know, all the, all the juicy stuff that's not actually published in the actual tshuva. And maybe we'll give some more examples of that next week, of, of, of what was going on over there. But basically, this is a very, very lengthy tshuva. And uh, the base of Rhyme says, you absolutely cannot make any changes to this well-established Minag Ashkenaz that has been going on for many hundreds of years, and all the G'dayli Ashkenaz have okayed it, either explicitly or implicitly, by not changing it. And, um, you know, who are you to come along and change this? And... Um, you know, you know, authority to do this, and he really runs deep the um, authority of Minah. His main argument is actually interesting and touches upon what David Yehuda said before, and that is that he wants to claim that throughout the generations and the, the exiles and the various traumas that the Jewish people went through, we don't really know who's a Kayan. You know, people claim, yeah, I'm a Kayan, my father, you don't really know. There's way too much um, doubt uh, upon that, and therefore, if a non kohen duchens, that's a violation, and therefore, it's best to le- to leave this mitzvah un- not done because it's more of a risk of a non kohen duchening if a kohen doesn't duchen as long as he wasn't summoned, so he hasn't violated anything. But if a non kohen duchens, then he's violating the mitzvah that a non kohen is not allowed to duchen. And he says, on the contrary, it's the Israelis who have to try to somehow justify them in that they do duchen every day. I, if that's the case, that we're concerned that duchening, that they're not really kainim, so why are they duchening on Yom Tif? So he has a whole way to explain that also, that at the end of the day, yeah, you can't completely abolish it, because we have to have some way of those who at least think they're kainim to maintain that family tradition and, and, uh, and other arguments along those lines. And basically, that's the gist. Again, perhaps next week, if there's time, we'll get into more detail. Maybe we will end up making this into a three-part series. Um, of the Truva of the base of Ryan, but that is his approach, again, very strongly to promote the prominence of the Minhag and the authority of all those Paskim throughout the centuries who supported, whether explicitly or implicitly, this Minhag, and um, the s- suggested reasoning, which we haven't seen in any Sfarim heretofore, that it has to do with the questionable Yichas, the questionable lineage of um, those kind of, and we'll pause here for now.